Yes, this thing's working. I could, right, cool, it's working. And uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to you know, Serverless Days Milan. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, to speak at the event with so many speakers that I look up to personally as well. So I want to start today by telling you a story. So sitting in the audience today is my friend, the guy with a real big beard, uh, Thomas, who I've worked with uh, qu for quite a few years now. In fact, it's the third time I've hired him. I keep asking myself, why do I keep doing this to myself? Uh, but he's really, he's, he's quite good. So back in about 2012, I think, he pointed me to this talk on TED by a British designer by the name of Thomas uh, Straits, whereby he describes uh, an adventure, an experiment, a very daring one, where he tried to build a toaster from scratch. So Thomas went, went out and bought the cheapest toaster he can find for about four pounds, I think. And then he took it apart to see all the different bits you have inside a modern toaster to figure out what are the things that he actually needs to build from raw materials. So he ran around, traveled around the country to collect raw materials like some iron from a mine, talking to some pretty interesting uh, old miner, and he also found some useful pattern online to make a furnace out of a microwave, which is <laughs> pretty ingenious when you think about it. <laughs> so once he's done all that, cast his, uh, his, his own metal, uh, he also went about making a mold using synthetic plastic and uh, made his own mold using block of wood. And this is what his toaster looks like. <laughs> And this is what it looks like with cover and with the cable and all that. And by his own admission, once the toaster was connected, it, for about five seconds, the toaster toasted. And then, unfortunately, the element kind of just melted itself. <laughs> Which, I guess, is what you can actually expect from a toaster that looks like this, I suppose. <laughs> so the project took Thomas. <laughs> So the project took Thomas about nine months to complete, and it cost him just over a thousand pounds as well. I guess that includes travel and all of that. And compared to a commercial post that you can buy nowadays uh, for as little as uh, three pounds ninety-four cents. So although the toaster never quite worked as intended, I think Thomas still considered the project a success, and I think I have to agree, because ultimately the goal here wasn't to build a working toaster that can actually make toast, but it's an experiment to see what other things are involved to make a modern compliance. And he did receive a lot of fame and attention from the project as well. His uh, TED talk was viewed more than a million times, at least uh, 10 or 12 of those was accounted by <laughs> yours, yours truly. And <laughs> And the problem with uh, getting famous for doing this kind of daring adventure and project is that you have to keep upping the antique. So for his next project, he decided to go and live with a herd of goats and act and behave just like one of them so that he can be accepted into the herd. And I have absolutely, absolutely no idea what the hell is going on there, but I can only assume that Thomas was just having his lunch and because you know, he was living as a goat and acting like a goat, so he's have to eat like a goat as well. And I think at some point, you just have to draw a line between being daring to just being silly. And I think this is probably the line. <laughs> and if you put aside all the fame and attention and the chance of a lifetime to live as a goat, and look at what Thomas actually built as his part of as his project, you might find that his project was, well, delivered way over budget. It cost him about, what, 300 times what, you, what his competitors would cost. And uh, the project was also delivered way over time, taking num nine months. And most of all, what he delivered was completely and utterly unfit for purpose. You might say, hey, man, this is, no, chill out. This is an experiment. Don't be so critical. And I think you're right. But then again, it's experiment, but how willing are you to put the survive, to bet the survival of your company, of your business, on, a, on an experiment? And if you actually need to eat, and you need a toaster in order to eat, would you A, buy a working toaster for about four pounds, or B, spend lots of time, lots of money, and uh, build your own, and, hold, and cross the fingers, and hope that in nine months' time, you can start eating again? I think pretty much everyone in this room is going to say A, right? The hands up, you want to say B. <laughs> good, good. We're in a sensible bunch here. But let's see what we actually see in the industry. Consider X um, for obvious reasons that uh, X is a multinational enterprise and is a dominant player in the marketplace that is becoming increasingly competitive. 
So in order to drive its business forward, X decided that, hey, we need to build a general purpose compute platform on top of Kubernetes. So it's invested eight developers uh, way for maybe, I think, 18 months by the time, uh, by now, and build multiple versions of this uh, compute platform with no backward compatibility. So the teams that went and adopted the service uh, early on get stuck on version one forever with no support whatsoever. And the platform itself, even now, has no documentation. And from what I've heard, it's rather unstable and tend to go down quite a bit. So it has all the hallmarks of Thomas's toaster. But thanks to internal politics and uh, sunk cost fallacy, the most of the app well, all the application development teams were forced to migrate their services onto this general purpose compute platform. And all the developers are sitting there thinking, why are we wasting our time with this uh, when we've got so many features that we need to deliver to our customers? And you might think, meh, that's just enterprises. Uh, now those guys, uh, what do they know, right? We are crazy staffs, we have crazy ideas, we know what we are doing. So let me introduce you to why. A very small startup who sells socks, and they, they felt the, the strong need that they really, really need to also build a general purpose compute platform on top of their own Kubernetes cluster as well, which of course just begs the question of why? Why do you feel the need to build your compute cluster when your core business is selling socks? I mean, in some sense, I do kind of understand if I'm an engineer working for why and I want to explain to my, my friends and family what it is that I actually do, it's just way better to say that I build com you know, a compute cluster on top of Kubernetes, uh, on top of AWS, and all these fancy stuff I'm doing, as opposed to just saying, I help my business sell more socks. Even if that is literally the best thing you can possibly do to help your business succeed. And having worked at several startups already, and uh, including one with Thomas, where we actually ran out of money and uh, had to close down, I understand so intrinsically this, that time for a startup is the most scarce resource you can possibly have, and spending all of that development time on things that aren't core to your customer's needs just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And if your business needs to survive and needs to have the ability to execute some code in order to meet your customer's needs, then would you, A, use a managed service such as AWS Lambda, Azure Functions, Google Cloud Functions, and so on, or would you, B, spend lots of money, lots of time, instead of building on the things that your customer actually want from you, build your own poor imitation of what is available out there today. So my name is Yen Chui. I'm a principal engineer at Delta Zone. We are one of the sponsors for the event. As Luca mentioned earlier, we are a sports streaming platform. We offer sports on both uh, live as well as on demand on our platform. And right now, we support 40 different sports and over 300 different leagues around the world. And we're also available now in Italy for a few months now, where we are streaming Serie A and Serie B matches on our platform. And we also recently opened up in the US, uh, streaming live sports, uh, live boxing matches as well. In total, we are available in seven different countries across seven, uh, more than 30 different devices. And at peak, we have just about a million concurrent viewers today. And that number is going to grow as we open up in more and more territories. So for us, we do have some very interesting scalability challenges and technical challenges that we face day to day. So if you want to find out about what it is that we do, go to engineering.thezone.com. You can also find our open positions or follow us on Twitter. And uh, as I'm pretty sure like everybody else here, we are hiring. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> we are the sponsors for Happy Hour so that uh, after the, the conference, uh, you can talk to us. In fact, I think we've got a booth here somewhere. Is that right? Not sure. Okay, even if you don't, then uh, come talk to me or talk to uh, my colleague Bruno at the back or the guy with the big beard uh, sitting at the second row there uh, to find out what it, what it is that you like to work for the zone on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're also going to be there tomorrow for the job fair as well. On a personal note, I've been using AWS for almost 10 years now, so my age starts to show, even if my face doesn't show it, which is great. And since July, I've also been no nominated as one of the AWS serverless heroes as well. Just waiting for the blinds to close. <laughs> and uh, my journey with serverless started a couple of years ago. I think it was early 2015, just after the reInvent announcement. 
And it really kicked into gear in 2016 when I worked with Domus at the social networking startup, whereby we migrated our backend system to run pretty much entirely on serverless. So we learned an awful lot about many of the rough edges that you have with Lambda and how all the different things you've got to think about to actually make your serverless application production ready. So what do we actually mean when we say serverless? Um, in fact, uh, ever since uh, Lambda launched and this new you know, serverless thing became a thing, every time I say serverless, it's almost guaranteed that somewhere, somewhere in the room is going to say, oh wait, but there is still a server somewhere, <laughs> which of course is just missing the point entirely. And as uh, Goiko says best, and Goiko, we're going to hear from him later on today, that serverless is serverless in the same way that Wi-Fi is wireless. Even if there are still cables and wires dangling somewhere in the back there, the point is that it's not your problem anymore. When you try to use the Wi-Fi connection, do you even think about the cables that are connecting to those routers? Of course you don't. In the same, that's the same way with serverless as well. And um, it usually means uh, server technology is serverless uh, if uh, you don't pay for it when no one's using it and that uh, we don't have to worry about how to do uh, configuring the scaling, conf uh, configure the server themselves, manage the cluster, how to do the provisioning, all of that. You might also heard this term quite rec uh, this related term, the functions of service or FAST, and this is where you're going to find serverless technologies um, like AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, and Azure Functions, and so on, whereby you write a very small piece of code, a function handler that reacts to some event that happens and does some stuff, and you upload it to your cloud provider and rely on a provider to then invoke your function when some event happens in the cloud. It could be a customer calling one of your APIs with HTTP endpoint, and then that passes on to your Lambda function, or it could be an uh, IoT device uh, up triggering some update to some shared state going to IoT core, or it could be one of your internal services publishing a message to an SNS topic and to trigger some asynchronous processing. And when you configure functions of service to other something as a service, including infrastructure service, containers of service, and platforms of service, as you can see, functions of service is very close to platforms of service. The main difference being the unit of deployment is now not the application itself, but the individual functions that make up your application. And just because something is fast doesn't necessarily mean that it's serverless and vice versa. By our definition, so storage services such as S3 is and should be considered as serverless because, again, we don't care about the server themselves. We don't have to worry about scaling. And the same applies to database technologies like uh, DynamoDB. And um, uh, also for BI solutions, I've been using Google BigQuery and uh, Amazon Athena. Both of them should also be considered as serverless as well. And equally, just because something is fast doesn't necessarily mean that it's serverless. This is where you have uh, solutions such as Kubeless or the na new Knative that allows you to run functions as service on top of your own Kubernetes cluster. Now, as, as great as those technologies are and the means many developers where they are today, my problem with them and why I don't think they should be considered as serverless is that the Kubernetes cluster itself is still my responsibility. I still need to manage all the scaling, configure the server, provision them, and all the things around managing that cluster of machines. So by, that, by our definition for serverless, I don't think those solutions should be considered as serverless. It doesn't mean that they're not useful. It doesn't mean that they have no place. It just means that we shouldn't consider them as serverless. And of course, with those solutions, uh, even if no one is running any functions on your cluster, you're still going to end up paying for those cluster while it's running. And many of us industry leaders, such as Simon Wadley, would talk about how serverless will fundamentally change how we build businesses around technology and how you code. And I'm, f well, I'm for one, is a big believer in what Simon is saying. But the question is, why so many of us are so keen on these technologies and why <coughs> Why so many of us are so excited by serverless? I think for starters, you get a lot of scalability out of the box, and you can typically scale a lot faster than you can do yourself as well. For one, you don't have to wait for EC2 instances to spawn, which you know, typically take a few minutes, and you can tap into a vast pool of resources that the Lambda team is managing on your behalf when you need to scale. 
And there are, sure, there are uh, speed limits in terms of how fast you're able to scale, and we'll talk more about that later. But to even match those default speed limits yourself, you have to provision a lot of spare capacity all the time, just so that you can tap into them when you need to. And of course, when you have so much spare capacity lying around and not using them, you're paying a lot of money for things that you're not using. So because you're not paying for servers that you don't use with serverless, with uh, function service, then you also find that for a lot of solutions, a lot of workloads, they can be a lot cheaper than if you run that workload on a server. A really good example is uh, all these cron jobs that takes a whole server to run, even if you run them once maybe an hour for maybe a couple of seconds or a minute at a time, but you are paying 99.99% of, of that, you know, the, the resources are provisioning. <coughs> and you also get multi-AZ out of the box, which means you get very good baseline resilience out of the box without having to do anything yourself. And by moving, by, by allowing the cloud provider to take care of more of the infrastructure for you, you also get better security as well. No longer do I need to worry about having to constantly patch my AMIs to make sure that my operating system is up to date and has all the latest security patches, and I don't need to worry about patching the, the, um, the all my leveraging gear, uh, gears and all of that. And AWS can do a much better job automating all of that for me. In fact, a perfect example of this is in one of my previous companies, when the whole meltdown and Spectre thing happened, we were still busy trying to update all of our AMIs and then redeploy all of our services so that uh, we have the, right, the patches uh, in place. And we completely forgot the fact that we still got a bunch of Lambda services running when, until one day I just opened up Twitter and I saw a tweet from Chris Mums and said, uh, all the servers running AWS Lambda is now patched for Meltdown and Spectre. It's only at that point we realized, oh, right, we've got a bunch of Lambda functions as well. <laughs> and it's great that all of these things happen because Amazon is able to do all the heavy lifting for me. But most of all, I love serverless because a lot of things I find that stands in my way between having a great idea to actually being able to push something into production and start to test the idea against the market, things like, oh, we want to build this feature. What language or framework do we want to use? Uh, do we need to learn the language, the framework itself? How do we do deployment? What about CI, CD? What about my AMIs? What do I need to install as part of my AMI and uh, configuring my ELBs or ALBs and setting up also scaling groups and uh, all of that just kind of goes away or has been drastically simplified when I moved to serverless. For deployment, I use the serverless framework, which I think is great, but there are many other alternatives out there for you as well. And in terms of setting up ELB and many of those other things, I just don't have to think about them anymore, or they're just taken care of by the uh, services such as API Gateway. So in return, I get far greater velocity from having a good idea to then be able to test it in production against the market. Because I now have minimized the amount of things that I need to do that are not important to, my, to meeting my customers' needs, things like managing servers, configuring auto-scaling, and so on. And having less things to manage and having less things that are my responsibility means that there are fewer, there are less operational overhead on my team so that we can focus more of our time and energy on doing the things that our customers actually want from us. So this great velocity from having an idea to having something running in production is the reason why so many of us are so keen on running things in serverless. But what about containers? Is that still going to be important going forward? Well, as Simon said it the best, um, that containers, just as a hypervisor before them, is going to continue to be an important but ultimately invisible subsystem for most people that are building applications. Because for me, building um, a startup that's selling socks to customers, why do I care about you know, what infrastructure that my code runs on? All I want is to be able to build some APIs, build some data processing so that I can serve, I can serve a, a website that, allow my, allow, that allows my customers to buy socks from me. But if you look around the industry, you can find this clear divide between the camp that strongly believe in containers being the future and the camp that believe that serverless is the future. By being here, I'm sure all of us are biased on the one side of the camp. I'm not going to say which. Uh, should be pretty self-evident. But even as much as I love serverless technologies, I have to say that serverless itself is not the goal. The goal should always be to build the best product that your customers love to use. 
But to do that, you need to be able to have lots of ideas and be able to test those ideas against the market quickly because for sure, 90% of those ideas are going to be bad ideas and you're going to want to find out the good ideas from the bad ones quickly by testing against the market and find out what your customers actually want from you so that you can then focus the, your energy and time on, on iterating on the good ideas and make them even better. And we also need to be able to deliver value to our customers quickly and frequently. And as developers, that means we need to shift our focus to creating business value, creating value to our customers, as opposed to being owners of technologies. That's not a point. That's not what we do. That's not our value to our business. Our value is in, crea is in the creation of value for the business, not to own technologies and not to create them. Unless, of course, you're AWS. <laughs> And I just find that serverless, and I love serverless because serverless just is a really good fit for this shift in mindset, this mindset of focusing on creating business value as opposed to creating technologies and creating things that you need to own as a team. But of course, the technology itself is still emerging. Many of the best practices itself is still emerging. There are still many rough edges around the services that you use. So that's why people like myself and many people in the audience has been going around the world, going, doing talks and sharing our experiences, building things with serverless. And a lot of things I've learned the last couple of years, I've been also putting them into a video course for Manning. And uh, in the last 18, 18 months, I did a quick summary. I've been writing a lot. <laughs> I've been seriously spending a lot of my time just writing and sharing experiences I've had on various different aspects around how do you build things with serverless. And uh, I put them all of them into one useful page that you can go and uh, find and read. But as I go around to different places and talking to lots of different people, I keep hearing some recurring arguments against why you, should, why you shouldn't use serverless today. And to be honest, I really, okay, let's take a moment and then debunk each one of these uh, in order. I think I'm going to start with the first one around the pricing that often I'll say, oh, I use serverless. And someone will say, well, good luck when Amazon plays around with the price going up and down every day by day. And this is just crazy to me because having used AWS for 10 years now, I can remember many, many price cuts. What I can't remember is a single instance that whereby, oh, well, my survey just gone from you know, $1 per X number of requests to request to you know, $3 X number of requests. I don't remember any, any price raises. And when I asked around and looked at some data, in the last five years, AWS alone announced the 67 price reductions across all of their services and zero price raises. So this argument of, uh, well, one day Amazon is just going to screw you over once they got you locked into their platform and raise prices on you just doesn't make any sense to me at all. The evidence is just not there. Unless your argument is entirely that anything can happen, we will happen, i.e., you know, sort law. But if that's the case, uh, we might as well just lock everybody else in this room uh, already because uh, we can all be a murderer, we can all be a, a thief or whatnot because anything can happen, will happen, right? Another one I keep hearing as well is that, oh, serverless just can't scale because of you've, got, uh, you've got scaling limits. Sure, you have uh, scaling limits, uh, but it's not like you don't have scaling limits when you run your own cluster of Kubernetes as well. You're, you're limited by how much you're willing to spend for resources that you're not going to be used. And with Lambda, the default limit of 1,000 concurrent execution is a soft limit, so all it takes is for you to go to the support forum and uh, raise a ticket. And nowadays, you can also get an auto approval to uh, raise to about 3,000 concurrent executions. The second limit, which is uh, harder to shift, is that when you are scaling up, you can scale up up to 500 new concurrent executions uh, per minute, which for some workloads that are very spiky, that could be a problem, sure. And that's actually one of the things that we are concerned with at the zone, because being a sports streaming platform, people just don't log in five minutes before the match. They log in 20 seconds. So we see a massive spike in traffic within the, like a 10, 20 second window. So we do have some concerns around this particular limit. But as I said, that is a hardish limit because uh, having spoken to AWS, they are very customer focused and they're, really, they're, actually, they're actually very happy to negotiate this limit if you got the right use cases. What I haven't been able to do is come up with the right number because every time we open up a new market, we got our number just got bump up. Bump up, bump up. So it's been quite hard for me to actually give them a, a good number that we can stick to. 
And also, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to raise, if, if you want to match this speed limit yourself in your own Kubernetes cluster, how many machines do you actually need to provision and not use as spare capacity so that you can you can scale up 500 new containers per minute? And how much, how willing are you to pay for that all the time? Another question I guess I want to pose to the audience is, suppose you've got a Lambda function uh, that have to handle, say, uh, 500 concurrent requests per second. How many concurrent executions do you think you actually need? Any guesses? Anyone? Thomas, come on, I'm going to point it to you now. <laughs> Give me a number, come on. 100? Well, I think the, the right answer is uh, I don't know because I haven't given you the second piece of information, which is how long your function actually runs. Uh, a single container that runs for, say, 100 milliseconds can do 10 requests per second by itself. A single container, a single function invocation that runs for 500 milliseconds can only do two requests per second itself, and therefore you're going to need uh, way more concurrent executions. So containers are reduced. And the amount of actual con the, uh, the amount of actual number of concurrent execution that you need to have is probably not what you're thinking in mind. In fact, for anyone who's doubts the ability for Lambda to scale, the next ver the very next talk we're going to have uh, Tyler Love uh, from Basel who are serving uh, who are using Lambda and GraphQL to serve uh, 80 million monthly users. So. Most people I speak to that are concerned about scalability, they have nowhere near that kind of traffic. So if Basel can do it, then chances are you can as well. You just have to learn the standard technology and learn the rough edges. Another thing I keep hearing about is this lack of control when it comes to Lambda. But when people talk about control, they don't talk about the other side of the coin, which is the responsibility you inherit. And of course, this argument around control is not new. I remember always the way back in 2009 when Amazon was, uh, AWS was just getting traction. There's all this argument around AWS in terms of the lack of control around your infrastructure. And uh, of course, now that you know, 10 years later, no one's talking about that anymore. But instead, we're arguing about lack of control when it comes to serverless. But what we're not talking about enough is for that, all that control that you want, how much are you willing to pay for it? Because to uh, control your own infrastructure comes with a lot of responsibilities. And to take on those responsibilities, you need to have the right skill sets in the organization. You need to have, if you want to run your own Kubernetes cluster in production, you better have people that really knows Kubernetes and knows how to operate it at scale. And that means you need to hire engineers and lots of them. And the last time I checked, the average salary for engineer in London is about 80,000 pounds, and by the time you factor in experience with AWS, experience with technologies that you're actually going to need, so the skill sets around Kubernetes and containers and so on, those numbers can really quickly go up as well. And when you hire lots of engineers, you also have admin costs around them as well. You need to hire uh, engineering managers to help them, and you also need to have office space, you need to have heating, you need to have uh, um, you need to have a fridge, you need to pay for the tea bags in the kitchen, and so on and so forth. I'm really familiar with this uh, because we just opened up an office in Amsterdam, and uh, uh, our guys can tell you how much uh, effort it takes to build up all the sort of admin support around your team. And of course, you need to take time off from your engineers and your managers to do recruitment, uh, taking time away from where they can, could have spent time on building and improving your product. Which you also then have uh, taken on to take a hit on your time to market. And when I sat down the other day and looked at all the co all the things that contribute to the total cost of ownership of infrastructure, it's just pretty crazy. I initially thought about the operational side of things, but as soon as you start thinking about all the human side of things, the development costs of engineers and having to and building tools and paying them, having offices and having engineering managers and having recruiters and paying the recruitment fees all the costs start to wrap up really, really quickly. So the big question you've got to ask yourself is, what are you paying for, really? It's one thing to say that for my business, I need to have really predictable performance for very critical business flow, then that's great. But it's quite another thing to want control for the sake of having control. I think that is really that's really dangerous, a dangerous trait to have. Because what is the point of having control if it doesn't actually help your business, doesn't help you meet your customers' needs, and without the right talents, all you're going to do is create a really poor imitation of services that you can use today, right now, from Amazon, from Azure, from Google, and other providers. So 
As Simon Sinek would say, always start with why. Understand what is your core business and how can you best deliver value to your customers and focus on those things. Another common argument I hear a lot is about this uh, vendor lock-in. And uh, of course, if you spend any time on the new, uh, Hacker News, it's a dark place where, where you just get this impression that uh, everyone is holding their torches and screaming, vendor lock-in is the root of all evil. But when I really look into it, a lot of the noise, a lot of the, uh, certainly the buzz from the vendor lock-in is coming from private cloud providers and, uh, and companies that are working with those cloud providers. So the argument seems to be, don't use the public cloud, they're gonna lock you in, so use our private cloud instead uh, because it's not locked in at all because it's all containers. So I'm sitting here thinking about that and thinking, right, so instead of being locked in with AWS, uh, who's probably gonna be around for a lot longer than my company is, uh, I'm gonna be instead locked into your private, your proprietary solution and all the skills that you can offer me and the alternative is that, because it's not a login, is then go and build my own toaster uh, with whatever skill set that I have, or I have to go out to the market and spend a lot of money on the skill sets I'm gonna need to actually take on those responsibilities. So the risk of vendor locking is just one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that you're gonna get a lot of reward in return. In this case, you can actually extract the maximum amount of value from the cloud providers that you're already working with. Um, they can help you minimize the amount of uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting, things like managing servers and so on and so forth that are not core to your business. And in return, you get much faster time to market, which is for most business, the most important thing for you. Because again, time is the most scarce resource for everybody. So for me, vendor lock-in is a problem that is all noise and with very few subs uh, substance behind it. And when I really think about it, in nowadays with the with the computer being so easy and readily available, and competition is more is increasing by the day, that the risk for me as a business is that my competitor is going to be able to iterate faster, they can innovate faster, they can provide value to the customers a lot better than I can, and they're going to be able to lock me out of my market sector way before any proposed, supposed uh, vendor locking risk is going to happen and start to bite me. Which again goes, point of, goes, goes back to the point that for application developers, we need to shift our focus onto delivering business value instead of creating technologies. And again, this argument about vendor locking is not new at all. Um, as clearly my age is starting to show that, that uh, quite a few years back, this whole database locking was, uh, was the whole, oh, you know, database locking is the root of all evil. And then for some crazy period, you're gonna see, see, you saw a new ORM pretty much every single week and the ORMs was the new hope until of course we actually tried to use it and then we found out that the ORMs has got dark secret that they don't actually make database migration any easier. They add, a lot of, they add a lot of complexity and abstraction and on top of things, which means that you're constantly paying a tax when, you can't, when, you, when you're working on developing your application. But then the moment you, when that vendor lock-in problem actually materializes, you find that actually when I move from one database to another, the ORM just gets in the way. Just another thing that I've got to deal with when I try to migrate my database over as opposed to something that actually really helps me. And most of us that actually went into this craze with ORMs, in the end, we came out looking like this, like Luke, you know, with a lesser arm and all that. <laughs> so when you think about serverless, and when you think about locking, I think this article by uh, Nick probably sums up the best, that compute was always easy to move around, regardless whether it's running in containers, running on VMs, or running inside a uh, Lambda function, they were always easy to move around. You might have to write, rewrite some part of your code, but it's no biggie. It's the data that weighs you down because the true danger with locking, especially with serverless, is the potential for data locking. Data has gravity; it accumulates. Data is uh, economically incentivized to leave by way of platform pricing, and this is the single biggest threat to vendor choice. And this article talks about serverless, but imagine with even with containerized solutions, you still have data. Your data is going to have gravity. Your data is still going to accumulate. Your data is still going to be economically disincentivized to leave. So, all the important things that actually, all the things that actually 
that is actually a vendor lock-in still applies when your, ser your services are running inside a container as much as when it runs inside a uh, function. So is vendor lock-in a risk? Absolutely. But part of being an adult is being able to, f to find risk and to understand the co uh, return on investment. By being here, I've taken a lot of risk. I have taken a flight. The flight could have gone down. I've taken, I've crossed the road where the cars are going zoom, zoom, zoom. And uh, in fact, I spent stand a night with a hotel with my friend Thomas. He could have murdered me for all I care. <laughs> Sorry, Thomas. Um, but is that return on investment worth the risk? Absolutely. As I've seen time and time again, Companies are able to do great things in a very short space of time when they, adopt, when they fully adopt serverless technologies. And the one thing we need to really guard against is this temptation to look for silver bullets because silver bullets just do not exist. Instead, we should adopt an approach whereby we try to use serverless technologies if possible, unless you've got workloads that cannot fit within the existing uh, um, limitations of the server technologies then sure, if you need to run something that's long running or if you've got workload that, is very, uh, that has to do with a consistent amount of high traffic. So for Netflix, for example, if they were to move all of their workload onto serverless, it's going to cost them a lot more money and their scale, those kind of money is going to really, really matter. And instead, we need to understand the trade-offs for each of any technology that we deal with and understand that when it comes to control, that control comes with a lot of baggage. Sometimes the control has got a lot of benefits and absolutely justified all the additional complexity and cost, but for a lot of us, that control is just another responsibility and another thing that we have to think about when we're trying to focus on delivering value to our customers. Personally, I don't think you should be either containers or serverless. I think the two should be used in conjunction. We keep talking about using the right tool for the job, but time and time again, I see right to the job is uh, interpreted as the tool that I'm most familiar with. So as developers, we should all invest time in understanding and the different technology options available to us so that we, when it comes to the time, we can make the, the, the best choice available to us. And with technologies like Fargate becomes more and more um, ready than, and, uh, and, and mature, um, with containers, you can also, I guess now it's blurring the line between con what is you know, containers workload with a serverless. But one thing I want to beg of you is please do not be your own toaster. It's not going to end well for you or anybody else that uses it. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your time.